Welcome to our continued study of the Jesus Sermon on the Mount. We're coming uh, near the end of this. Uh, uh, today, we're going to be picking up uh, chapter 7, verse 13. Um, so we're in the uh, last time we were together, we started the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount. There's kind of the introduction, the body of the sermon, and then the conclusion. And so um, the words we started last time together were, were the beginning of the conclusion. We'll continue a look at that conclusion today in 713. But uh, uh, let's start out with a word of prayer. Uh, gracious God, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for your, the gift of your word. Your word is truth. And we pray that, that each of us as your children would come to a deeper understanding of the truth of your word. Uh, we pray that you would uh, guide us in that truth, that you would help us to uh, better understand that truth. And just open our eyes to that truth today as we gather around your word. I pray that your Holy Spirit would do the leading and the working in, in our hearts and lives, uh, strengthening our faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we get into uh, the verses today, uh, just an introductory question for us. Uh, and and as, you, as you think of our faith as Christians, right, uh, and, and, and the, the faith walk that we have, the, our life of following after Jesus, um, what are some things that are difficult about that? What are some things that are difficult about that? Other things that you might want to do. Okay. <laughs> Other things that might maybe look appealing instead of this walk with Jesus. Yeah. Okay. Maybe finding a place to be connected and go through that walk with other people. Okay. Like I know people that have moved and, um, you know, have that have that problem when they're connected one place and then to try to get connected at another place and. We haven't had that <laughs> We've been in the same place for all these years, but um, I think that can be a problem. Yeah, and I think even even if it's not moving and things like that, I, some people some people just uh, for whatever reason they 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 struggle kind of finding that community and finding those people to support them. And the Christian walk is not meant to be ma made alone, right? This journey is not a a, a solo journey. Uh, yet sometimes. We find ourselves kind of alone in the journey for various reasons, and and so having the people around us to support us. Okay. What else? I think consistency. Sometimes it's just what I do. Yeah. And then other times it's more of a struggle, but like Bill said, life happens. Lots of distractions and. Yeah. So just being consistent. Yeah. And the life of Je following Jesus is not always a popular one necessarily uh, in this world we live in anymore, right? And so uh, sometimes there's that that we battle against. Um, uh, sometimes the life of following Jesus leads us into kind of uncomfortable areas that, that you know, um, uh, challenges us to live or be in certain ways that we're not always comfortable with. Okay, well, I'd rather go do that other thing than be in this uncomfortable state and area so yeah lots of things that uh, maybe make the walk with jesus not always an easy one um, and and i believe in these first words that we're going to look at today um jesus recognizes that as well that the the walk um to follow him is not always uh an easy one so let's jump into our our text for this morning Verse 13 says, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. And, and so Jesus starts out talking here about a, a gate, right? A, uh, a gate is a is an entry point, right? And, and he talks about the gate, uh, the, the relationship here between the gate and the way. He, he kind of uses those maybe interchangeably. But as you think about a gate and a path, where is a gate typically located on a path? The beginning? 
or the end. Yeah, it kind of depends which way you're headed, right? It's yeah, it's either the beginning or the end. That's kind of usually where the gate is at, right? Yeah, not necessarily in the middle. And and so, and I think Jesus uh, can uh, we can kind of look at the gate from both perspectives, right? There is a there is an entryway into this path we call the the, the life of discipleship, right? So there is a gate at the beginning. And in a sense, there's also a gate at the end, right? As we enter into eternity, there's a gate there too. So th this path of faith, there is kind of a beginning gate and an ending gate. And uh, I don't know that Jesus is picking out one or the other here necessarily. Um, uh, maybe, maybe in a way referencing almost both of them uh, at the same time, um, right? Uh, but but talks about here the the narrow uh, versus the wide, right? And says the wide way is the easy way. Um, so so we we talked a little bit already about why the why the narrow way of following Jesus is is maybe difficult. What makes the wide way the easy way? Not a lot of rules or restrictions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's 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 lots of options when it comes to the wide way, isn't there? A lot of options. You, you can enter it in a lot of different uh, from a lot of different points. The wide way is uh, often a way that, um, at least at the time, feels good to the flesh. Right? Feels good. And it's, it's uh, you know, that makes it easier when it, when it feels good uh, in that sense, right? So there, uh, there's an easiness to, to kind of following that way. Um, and of course, we've already talked about why the narrow way um, is, uh, is hard. Um, now, Jesus warns us that, that, that although the wide way is easy, well, uh, he, he warns us there very clearly, the end of the wide way is destruction. Uh, so he does talk about the, the, the final gate and the, the final gate of that wide way uh, leads to destruction. There he's, he, certainly he's talking about um, the destruction of, of eternity, right? Uh, and so he is kind of talking there about the end. Um, the, that connection between the narrow and the wide also, um, the wide, there are many on the wide path and fewer on the narrow path. So if you ever feel like Christian, yeah, as a Christian, you're in the minority, that's, according to Jesus, that's kind of the reality, isn't it? Uh, if, if we just look at by the numbers worldwide, um, I haven't looked at the numbers recently, but there, I think we're approaching probably 7 billion people in the world now, um, uh, moving quickly toward that. And uh, there's roughly 2 billion plus Christians in the world. So if you just do proportion wise, uh, uh, about a third of people living in the world are, are, are identify themselves as Christians and about two thirds don't. So there's the few and the many right there just in the, in the numbers. Probably some of those that identify really aren't. Right following the path me <laughs> exactly path. yeah and and jesus is actually going to get to that in these verses even yeah later on he's going to uh he's going to talk about those some of those that do identify uh, aren't going to walk through the gate at the end um uh and and he'll tell us why that is and, and we'll see why that is as well yeah and the key really is is of all this is the gate right enter by the gate Right, we got to make sure we're in the right gate, and so the, the question for us becomes: Well, what is the what is the gate? What is the way uh, that we are to be walking? Now, um, now here we're going to jump out of Matthew's gospel into John's gospel because I think that gives us insight into the way and and the gate. So, uh, John fourteen verse six, Jesus said, "I am the way." the truth and the life. No one comes to the father except through me. So Jesus clearly identifies himself as he is the, that, that path that we are, uh, that we are called to be on. Uh, what does it mean? What does it look like? Well, it's Jesus, plain and simple. All right. Very clearly says that. And then um, if, if you look back in John 10 verses seven through nine, 
Um, this is part of Jesus' longer um, uh, uh, discussion where he talks about, uh, I, am the, I am the shepherd, I am the good shepherd, and, and you're the sheep, right? Talk about that sheep-shepherd relationship here. Uh, but as a part of that, he also says this in verses 7 through 9. Jesus again said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. Another uh, accurate translation of that would be gate, same word, right? Uh, so because he could be saying, I am the gate of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door or I am the gate. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Uh, and so as Jesus talks about the narrow gate and the narrow way, we see elsewhere from, uh, from his words, he's talking about himself. Right? This is me. You, you get in through me. I'm the path to follow, right? Um, and uh, he says, all others are, are just thieves and robbers. Don't listen to them. They're, they're not legitimate. Questions or comments about 13 and 14 there? So in this reference, he actually is talking to the gate at the entry, at the beginning, because it says, how narrow is the gate and difficult the road. Yes, yeah. So, and he does, he does almost appear to be talking, because he says, enter by the narrow gate. Yeah, so, so it's, it's entering, and then we're going into the way, but then he, at the end, says, the, the, the road, the, the wide gate leads to destruction. And so, uh, so it's almost as if Jesus is referring to the gates at both ends, okay. yeah, in, in Matthew here, yeah. Um, and, and I think verses such as these that we just read uh, shouldn't make us surprised that it's sometimes hard to convince people to come and join us at church <laughs> or convince people to come and be a Jesus follower, right? Um, you know, we, we work at that. We try at that. We don't always have success. I know it's frustrating and difficult, but it shouldn't come as a surprise. Jesus said many are those that are going to lead to the path of destruction. Yeah. Even many of those that were listening to Jesus himself speak. Um, we don't know how many disciples are gathered around him for the Sermon on the Mount. It doesn't tell us at the, at the beginning, um, but, but we know there are, are, are some, uh, but it also talks about the crowds that are on the hills. And my guess is if you counted the number of disciples sitting there right at the feet of Jesus listening and you counted the crowds beyond them that are listening, there would be fewer disciples and bigger crowds, right? Why? Because greater is the wide is the way that leads to destruction. And so even Jesus himself had that, had that same issue uh, of people just not interested and not wanting to follow. So we shouldn't be surprised at it either. Well, had, had most of the disciples been called at this point? Um, in Matthew's story, uh, uh, the disciples, yes, have been called. So um, the Sermon on the Mount starts in chapter five. Uh, the calling of the first disciples, anyway, is in, in chapter four. Okay. Um, uh, now, we don't, uh, now Matthew himself isn't called until Matthew's eight or nine. So he hasn't been called yet. Um, uh, but, uh, but we know at least Peter, Andrew, James, and John, those four for sure have been called and probably some of the others. So, um, so uh, if we're talking the specific 12, yeah, some of them are on board. Um, but we have to remember that when, when scripture talks of disciples, it doesn't just mean the 12. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, there are others involved as well. Verse 15 then, and this also I think is part of what makes it hard. Um, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Uh, beware of false prophets, he says. And, and so this is part of, again, part of what makes that, that narrow way so difficult, that wide way so easy. Why? Because there are these false prophets out there. And what do we know about these false prophets? He says they come in sheep's clothing. 
So what does that look like in a practical sense? I mean, um, we know Jesus, as he uses those words, is talking metaphorically. Um, and it, it's not literally that people are walking around with, uh, with, uh, with a, a sheep hide on their back. Um, so what is, he, what is he talking about there? What do these people really look like? Well, they're, they're, they're people that, that, that you probably like. They're common people. Okay. And yeah, you're going to like them. Yeah, and uh, they're, they're saying what you want to hear. Okay. And uh, it, which is probably not right. <laughs> <laughs> Easy. Easy. <laughs> Joe Olstein, you know, in particular. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. And, and Jesus hasn't used that language yet in Matthew anyway, but, but as we look at Jesus' overall message, who are the sheep? That's us. You are. So he's, yeah, so he's saying as, as false, pro these false prophets look like sheep on the outside. So they look like one of us as disciples, right? Which means they say the right things. They do the right things. Um, they, uh, they, they, they look like they, uh, they look like they're on the same team. They look like they're on the same side. And they use the right words. And yes. They, yeah. Um, they can definitely use the right words, but intermingle with they know the lingo and they know the words and but you're right they they use those words but with a different meaning or with a different twist uh, or with a different foundation right all of that is is part of how they how they operate um, and i think because of that these false teachers are very appealing because number one on the surface they look like us right and um what did we, we talked about, is that last week or a couple of weeks ago where we talked about judging, <laughs> uh, right? And, and, and that how the world sometimes uses that against us, you know, don't, don't judge lest you be judged. Um, and, uh, and, and, oh gosh, he looks like us. So I better not, I better not judge. He's got to be good and looks like us. And like you said, Les, kind of person that you like. Mm -hmm. And when you see the, the false teachers that really, uh, especially those that are successful, they're usually pretty charismatic and they're usually pretty likable. Like, yeah, I like that guy. I want to hang out with him. I want to be around him. Uh, and so that's part of what makes the, the false teachers so, uh, so dangerous, right? Is because they look and sound just like us. Um, So continuing on, what else do we know about these false teachers? Continuing on in verse 16. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. Um, so first, uh, Jesus uses it both at the beginning and at the end, that word recognize. Um, in the Greek, that's probably a stronger word than what we usually use as recognize. You know, I, when I hear that word recognize, sometimes I can use that word as, oh, that, you know, that looks vaguely familiar. You know, I, I kind of think I know who that person is. I kind of recognize them, but maybe I don't know their name. You know what I mean? Recognize is like, okay, I, I know I shouldn't know more about this, I, but I, maybe I don't have the full picture. The original Greek word that Jesus used there is much stronger. It, it, uh, some translations, even uh, I've seen it uh, translated as truly know, truly know. And, and that's really what Jesus is getting at there. You will really know the truth here, right? And, and this is how you will really know the truth. It's not just a, ooh, I think maybe I'm seeing any of this, but it's kind of cloudy. No, that's not what he's talking about. This is you will know, right? Uh, this, is where, this is where you're going to get certainty. Uh, so a little different force there than... Um, than what this translation has. Um, 
You will know. But we don't always know, right? And that's that's the that's the trouble. So so how will we know? And that becomes the question for us, right? How will we actually know? Um, and and that uh, and and Jesus I think answers that question for us. How will we actually know? And his answer by their fruits. By their fruits. The question though is, what is the fruit of a of a prophet? What is the fruit of a prophet? It's the, it's the things that they teach. Yeah, it's the things that they teach. It's not the life that they live. Because remember, we just learned that by the life that they live, what do they look like? They look like us. They look like sheep. They, they're, the life they live, is they're right on. They're doing it well. They're doing it right. So we're not going to know it by the life that they live. But we'll know it by the message that they teach and does the message that they teach line up with truth or not so the question then next question becomes for us uh, because I, I think you're right Cheryl I think this is not easy I think we don't always truly know and a lot of times we're just we feel uncertain so how do we truly know what false teaching is how do we figure that out we come back to the word what happens when the false teacher is quoting the word? You have to be careful where, how they're, if they're taking it out of context. Okay. Um, so checking the context is important. Um, yeah. Are, are they, are they changing the context? Are they taking just a verse and ignoring the rest of the larger context? That's all important. You know, it Does. sounds like to me that, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. It sounds like to me, though, we have to know the truth so we know what other prophets or other teachers are saying. Because if we don't, if we haven't studied and, and, and know God's word, then we could easily be taken in by the false teachers. Yeah, you're exactly right. The, the way to recognize falsehood is to know the truth and to know the teaching and to learn the teaching. Yeah. Uh, so that's so that would be really very. So that would be another reason why it would be so easy for some people to follow the false prophets because they don't know any different. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, because what they, because most often those false prophets, and scripture even says, describes Satan, for example, he masquerades as an angel of light, right? And when Satan came to Jesus to tempt him in the wilderness, what did he come with? He came with the word of God, but he twisted that word of God. He took that word of God out of context, right? And so someone that doesn't have a solid foundation of the truth, that's going to be easier to be led astray. Um, uh, now, I, I've read this from a couple different sources, so I, I, I tend to think this is true, but it's one of those things I read on the internet, so you never know, but um, that, uh, that those who are trained to recognize counterfeit money, that most of, uh, most of their training in recognizing counterfeit money comes from the time they spent with real money. And they become so familiar with real money and what it looks like and what it feels like and what all the special markings ought to be. They become so familiar with the real thing that it becomes very easy for them to recognize a fake because it's different, right? And, and so I think for us as Christians, yes, I think you're right, Sharon, the easiest way to, to, to truly know and recognize false teaching when it comes is to be well grounded in the true teaching. And the better grounded we are in this, the easier it becomes to recognize that which is false. It becomes very apparent to us. It's like, that's not right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so let's look up, uh, Just a, we'll just look up one verse here. Matthew 16, and I, I didn't put this on the screen just because it's a longer section, but Matthew 16, 13, you know. So where, where, what is the truth that we need to, to, to be learning and knowing and where does it start? Um, 
And, and I think this really becomes the question. Uh, Matthew chapter 16, starting at verse 13, and uh, Jesus here uh, gathered with his disciples, it says, right? So he's not with the crowds, he's just with his disciples, and says, Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the son of man is? So when it comes to false teaching and truth, that's where we need to begin. Who do they say that Jesus is? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Well, they weren't all wrong in some of those answers. Was Jesus a prophet? Yeah. Okay. No. Um, so, and, and our world today, if you ask people who, who is Jesus, they're not necessarily going to get it all wrong. But just because you don't get it all wrong doesn't mean you have the whole truth either, right? But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? And here's the right answer, verse 16. Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church. This rock being his confession of faith, not Peter himself, right? On this rock of confession, on these words you just said, that's where I'm going to build my church. And so what do we come back to as the truth in terms of recognizing uh, false prophets? We come back to that confession of faith. Jesus is the Christ, the son of God. That's where we start. Now, there's more to it than just that, right? Uh, but that's where it starts. And and we saw that, you know, we just uh, last year looked at at, uh, at the letters of John. If you were with us for the letters of John, you remember John kept coming back to how do we recognize truth and how do we recognize falsehood? And John kept coming back to this same thing. Who is Jesus? And if you get Jesus right, then you've got truth. If you get Jesus wrong, doesn't matter the other stuff. Doesn't matter how you're living your life. Doesn't matter how many times you go to church. Doesn't matter how often you pray. If you get Jesus wrong, it's not truth. It's not truth. So you got to get Jesus right. As I said, there's more to just this than getting Jesus right, but this is the start. This is the start. Questions, comments, thoughts about that. I, I think I brought this up Sunday about when things would happen and Jesus would tell them to go tell or to not go tell. Mm -hmm. And down here in verse 20, it says, then he gave the disciples orders to tell no one that he was the Messiah. Mm -hmm. Which your and your answer was that it so his time will have to come yet. Right. And that's why they were not. Yeah, I think that's a case of my time hasn't come yet. You go tell them I'm the savior. They're going to put me on a cross right now. And it's not time yet. Yep. Okay. Back then to Matthew uh, 7. So it's, it's, it's the fruit and the fruit is the teaching. Uh, Jesus then has these questions, right? Uh, can grapes come from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? And well, of course, it, no, that doesn't happen, right? And so if uh, the true teaching cannot come from a false heart, and a false teaching is not going to come from a true heart, right? If someone's got a true heart, they're not going to be teaching falsehood. Uh, that's, uh, they, they can't go together, right? Um, but and what's the result of what happens to these, these trees? Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. What's Jesus referring to there, this thrown into the fire stuff? Oh. Yeah, that's judgment language, hell. Yeah. Um, and that, that becomes more clear as we read, get further on in Matthew's gospel, but we'll, we'll, we'll recognize that. But yeah, when Jesus, whenever he talks about thrown into the fire stuff, he's talking about judgment and he's talking about hell. Right. Oh, this is, that's kind of end time language. And, and so it, it, because it's end time language, it's the other truth for us that we are going to have false teachers 
in our midst until Jesus returns. That's going to be a reality that our world continues to deal with until Jesus returns. So that means we as Christians need to continue learning the truth, continue grounding ourselves in the truth, continue turning back to scripture, continue turning back to Jesus so that we're not led astray by those false teachers. And I think part of it is just a, also a confidence in, in God and in his word and in the work of his Holy Spirit that, that you know, when I come with humility to the word of God and, and ask the Holy Spirit to work in my heart, he's not, God's not going to reveal falsehood to me, right? God's not going to lead me into falsehood. And so, um, you know, when I come with that attitude to the word, we can also have a confidence, you know, God's going to protect me from that error. You know, because I think sometimes we fear, we fear that we get afraid of that. And, um, and, and I think having that confidence, you know, as a child of God, God's going to protect me from that. As I come to his word and let his spirit work, God's going to protect me from that. Questions or thoughts on those false teachers that he is talking about there. I believe Jesus still has those false uh, prophets, excuse me, is the term he uses. I believe Jesus still has those false prophets in his mind when he speaks these next verses in verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. These are definitely words of law. <laughs> um, right? this, this is not gospel language <laughs> speaking here. Um, starts out with that, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. And I think there we have to recognize that uh, now Jesus, again, he's continuing his, his end time language here. Uh, he, he transitioned into end times when he in uh, back there in, in verse 19 when he talked about the things being thrown into the fire and, and now he's still talking kind of in that end time language okay uh, so he's not talking about kind of every day you know what's going on he's talking about end times when he comes for the final judgment there are people who are going to say lord lord who are not going to enter the kingdom of heaven we know this is true if we look, for example, at a verse like Philippians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, um, it says, uh, says this, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. When Jesus returns, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, but not everyone's going to be saved, Right. And so we know that at eternity, that when we stand at the gate, there are going to be people that are going to come up to say, Jesus, Lord, Lord, and yet are not going to be saved. Okay, that's, that's just the reality. Um, but what is the, the truth about these people that are confessing Jesus as Lord, Lord? Well, it will appear that this reading that ungodly people in that day could cast out demons. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that seems fun. And they were. Um, and, and Jesus says, these people are going to say to Jesus, but Lord, did we not cast out demons? Did we not prophesy? Did we not do mighty works? And notice the answer of Jesus. Jesus doesn't say, no, you didn't do those things. It's not like they were charlatans trying to hide the fact that they never did it and, and saying, oh, that we know this is what's going to get us there. So we're going to say we did these things and maybe you won't notice. That's not what the case. These people actually did these things, Jesus is saying. You, these are people who actually prophesied in the name of Jesus. They actually cast out demons in the name of Jesus. They actually did mighty works or miracles in the name of Jesus. And so you're right, Les. Jesus is telling us here that 
people can do things that appear miraculous mm -hmm. that are not ultimately from Jesus. How is that the case? How do we explain that? They were doing it for their own glory. Okay, they were doing it for their own glory, certainly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we hear about that in scripture, lots of stories of that, don't we? Doing it for their own advantage and their own profit. Yeah. Well, most false prophets, that's what they're doing. They're doing something to make them greater, bigger, or more important. It's what it appears to me. When sure. We false prophets, I'm thinking about basically some of the pastors that, that we know of that are crooked as a day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, and, and 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 those ones are maybe easier to recognize sometimes too, right? Um, uh, because it's their ministry is not about Jesus. Who's their ministry about? Themselves. About themselves, right? And it's about building up their kingdom. It's not about Jesus and building up the kingdom of God. It's about themselves and building up their kingdom. And so, um, don't we go back to the, the earlier verses and and look at what their fruit is, and and because. They're, they may have done these things, but their their their, their fruit or reason for doing them and so forth was not good. It makes them a bad tree, and so uh, it's not someone that God would know. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No. Absolutely. That's that's one hundred percent right. Because uh, again, what did these false prophets look like? They looked like sheep. And if they look like sheep, what are they going to be doing? They're going to be doing prophecies. They're going to be doing miraculous things they're going to be doing all the things that sheep do so it, sh it comes as no surprise that there are going to be people that are doing sheeply things like that that aren't going to be making the cut why because of what's in the heart what's on the inside right uh, because they're missing something in there um and, and and that's and that's what jesus is getting at on the outside you guys might have been doing the right thing but on the inside right i i recognize you by your fruit your teaching was wrong what was on the inside was wrong. And so it doesn't matter what you're doing. It doesn't matter if you're healing in my name. It doesn't matter if you're prophesying in my name. It doesn't matter if you're going to church every Sunday or praying all the time. It doesn't matter if you're doing those things. If the inside is wrong, if it's coming from the wrong inside, none of it's any good, right? None of it's any good. Uh, and it all is then, then thrown out. Okay. So the question then becomes, well, okay, what is necessary? Again, these are words of law, and that gets kind of scary, right? And Christians have even read these verses. I mean, I believe Bible-believing, well-meaning disciples of Jesus have sometimes read these verses and kind of swallowed hard and said, gosh, am I okay then? <laughs> you know, I, I'm, uh, I say, Lord, Lord, and, and I go to church and I pray. Uh, am I okay? I, am, am I all right? What does it take, according to Jesus here? To be okay and to be all right. It's faith. Yeah. The way Jesus puts it, the one who does the will of my father. So we have to ask ourselves, okay, well, what is the will of the father? Right? What, is, what does God want us to, to do? What is the will of the father? Uh, and uh, Linda, I think you're right. I think ultimately the answer to that question is, well, it's faith, right? God wants us to believe the truth and believe in him and trust in him. We see that elsewhere. Um, this is Matthew 21, 31 to 32. Uh, I didn't put the whole context up there. Maybe it's helpful to, if you've got your Bible, to kind of look at the context. Um, Matthew 21. So... Um, this is uh, Jesus has just entered into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. So this is part of his Holy Week teaching, um, his Holy Week teaching, uh, the, the themes of his Holy Week teaching. If you've ever noticed that there's really kind of a shift in themes. Um, he's very much talking now about end times and about uh, about when Jesus when he returns and that kind of language. Um, and in in the he tells here the parable of the two sons is the title of it. Right. Um, and it starts out in verse 28. What do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. 
Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He said, I will, sir, but he did not go. And Jesus said, well, which one did the will of his father? And so Jesus here taught, answers the question, right? Which one of the two did the will of the father? They said the first. Jesus said to them, truly, I say to you, the tax collectors and prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness and you did not, there it is, believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even when you saw it, you did not afterward change your mind and believe him. Right. So which of them did the will? Um, Jesus here says, what is the will of the father? It's to believe, right? It's to believe. And the tax collectors and prostitutes believed the message. And that's why they're going to be saved, even though on the outside, they didn't have all the, the right things in their life, weren't doing the right things, weren't acting in the right way. On the inside, they believed. And he's, he's saying this to Pharisees, right? Um, uh, because that he's being questioned at this point by the Pharisees. And he's really kind of pointing the finger at them and saying, and you guys, even though you look like you've got all the right stuff on the outside, you don't believe on the inside. You've got to believe. And so what is the will of the father? When Jesus, you know, back in uh, there earlier in Matthew says, uh, who will enter the kingdom of heaven? The one who does the will of my father. What's the will of the father to believe the message that Jesus has come to share with us, that he is the Christ, the son of the living God. And when we believe that message, we have faith and we then get to enter the kingdom of God. Uh, John makes it even maybe a little more clear in John 6, verse 40. He says this, actually, he makes it abundantly clear. I mean, you can't miss this, right? For this is the will of my father, that everyone who looks on the son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. It makes it abundantly clear. What does it mean to do the will of the father, to look to the son and to believe? Look to the Son to believe. That's the will of God. So I, I think that, that means as Christians, we can come back to these verses in Matthew 7, 21 to 23, when they make us swallow hard and say, oh gosh, am I okay then? We can look at these verses with confidence and say, yeah, I am okay. Because I do believe. I do believe that truth. I do believe that Jesus is the Christ. I do believe that he is the way to heaven. I, I do believe that he is the gate. Um, I believe those things, which means I'm okay, which means that the last day when I say, Lord, Lord, he's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Come on in. <laughs> Welcome. Right. And uh, because we've got the faith that backs it up. But even though that's true, you oftentimes don't feel that way. No, you're right. <laughs> And why is that? I'm just a simple person. Poor, miserable sinner. Yep, I am a poor, miserable sinner. Uh, and uh, it was, um, I don't remember where he wrote this or where he said this. Um, I, I should look it up sometime so I know the reference. But uh, someone came up to Martin Luther with that very question. You know, I don't always feel, and, and I question, am I really saved? And Martin Luther's response was, if you are questioning whether or not you are saved, that is evidence that you are probably saved. Because <laughs> the person who's not saved doesn't necessarily care, right? If they're question, if they're not even quite asking the question, that question's not even on their mind, right? But if you're one who's genuinely struggling and saying, gosh, poor miserable sinner am I, look at the way I'm living, look at the, what I'm doing, look at these questions and doubts that I have, how can God possibly save me? Um, Luther used that as an encouragement to say, well, that's exactly what you need to be saved is the recognition that you shouldn't be. <laughs> yeah. You're right. You, we struggle with that all the time. Yeah. All the time because we are sinners, because we are at the same time, saint and sinner. And so we have that struggle. And I think that's why we come back to this truth that says, no, you are a child of God. When you believe, when you have that faith. Is it a perfect belief and a perfect faith? No, Jesus never says that anywhere. Right? You look at the story of God's people throughout scripture and guess what they did? They had doubts and they had questions. 
that's okay. Um, but when we have doubts and questions, what do we do? We come back to this, <laughs> right? We don't answer them ourselves. We don't make up our own answer, right? We don't follow after the ways that we come back to this. And as long as we keep doing that, we're okay. Even with the questions, even with the doubts, even when we're not perfect, right? And hopefully all of us as God's children can look at our lives today and say, like, you know, I have fewer questions and doubts than I did 20 years ago. <laughs> Uh, and that's not always the case. Christian faith is like this. It's like a roller coaster. It's got its ups and downs, right? But hopefully there's kind of a, this upward trajectory for all of us, this, uh, this trajectory of growth. Uh, but because we are poor, miserable sinners, it's not always the case either. Yeah. Other thoughts and questions? I think what we've talked about today um, is reinforced then in what we'll talk about next week. And, and that is the, the story of the wise and foolish builder. Uh, uh, come ready to sing that Sunday school song. You remember that one? Wise man built his house upon the rock and the rains came tumbling down. You don't remember that one? Oh, my goodness. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, we didn't, I don't think we did that one. Not like the 12 men when they spy on Canaan. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, there's a good one. Huh? Good. Let's uh, close with the word of prayer. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, we give you our thanks and praise for grounding us in this truth of your word. Um, we thank you that your Holy Spirit has entered into us through the waters of baptism and by the promise of this word to help us believe, because we know that we can only say, Lord, Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit. And so continue to fill us with your Holy Spirit. Continue to give us that faith. Continue to, uh, to do that work in us. In fact, bring that work to completion so that in the day of Jesus, we can be found faithful, trusting and believing in you. Uh, we, we pray that you would grant that gift to your church and to all of your people. And, and we lift up, Lord, the needs of your people, the needs of your church. They are many. You know them. Uh, we just pray that you would hold those in the palm of your hand and, and meet your needs, meet those needs according to your will uh, and strengthen your people in the midst of their affliction. We celebrate the joys that we have in, in this life and, and give you thanks for all the blessings that you pour out uh, upon us. And um, we just ask that as we, um, as we go our separate ways here today, that you would go with us, that you would guard us, that you would keep us always um, in your tender care through your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Thank you.